Yeah, cool. Good morning. I am not a public speaker, so I hope this goes well. All right, Romans 10. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But righteousness, but righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. <sighs> Sorry. For with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For, there, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all of the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. I'll make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, sorry, <laughs> Isaiah is so bold as to say, I've been found by those who did not seek me. I've shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I fell in my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. That's a tough act to follow right there. <laughs> wow. Rich, do chapter 11. <laughs> I'm going to let you do it. I'm just testing you. Uh, it's great to be in the house of the Lord. Um, last, last month I got quite a bit of recognition and appreciation. Um, but I just want to let you know I want my wife and kids to stand up so I could embarrass them. Uh, More job. I, I would not be the man I am without them. They've um, put up with a lesser version of me for many years. And uh, they've put up with me. They've helped me grow up as a man, as a person. And I definitely would not be who I am without them. Billy wants to know if there'll be more cake. <laughs> Not today. Next week is potluck, though, and communion, so if you want to sign up for sides in the back, that's cool. Um, as we continue to march through Romans, it's very important that we remember Romans chapter 8, because that is God's ideal for the Christian walk. It's a, it's a perfect chapter. I love to read it over and over again. Um, that there's no condemnation, that we can't be separated from his love, that he's our father now, that um, if he's for us, who can be against us? You know, just on and on. There's just verse after verse after verse. And Romans 8 is what he has for each of us. And then for us knuckleheads, he has 9, 10, and 11. Um, 
We don't always live out the life that God wants us to live out. We don't always accept the promises he has for us through ignorance or stubbornness or, or just pure disobedience. That's the way his children were, the children of Israel, but he never gave up on them. He's got Israel past, Israel present, Israel future. That's 9, 10, and 11. He never gives up on his children, and he won't give up on you. His plans for you never change. He loves you, can't take his eyes off of you. You're perfect in his eyes because you're his children. It's his work, it's his faithfulness. And it's great how, like last week at the last part of chapter 11, we saw that even through the disobedience of Israel, he was able to bring in Gentiles. That even through disobedience, he could flip the script and make that something wonderful also. So he ends up saying, who can know the ways of the Lord? Who can even know? Because even in disobedience, there's redemption. Even in disobedience, the people are brought in. So God's plan is always redemption. It's always reconciliation. It's always that we have peace with him. So chapter 12 starts out, um, and I love the King James Version of this. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And what he's saying is, in light of all this wonderful stuff that he's already talked about, he's saying, I'm asking you, I'm pleading you, I'm begging you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Notice he is not mandating to them, he is not putting them under compulsion, he's not commanding them, he's asking them, which is the Christian way. The Christian way is that a leader would lead and plead and pray not manipulate and push and act like a thug. And it doesn't matter what your best intentions are. If you're pushing people around, it's not a good idea. He's pleading with them. He's saying, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And I I like that term, living sacrifice, because it's very descriptive. But the problem with a living sacrifice is when you put it on the altar, it might get up and walk away, you know, because it's still alive. So many times, I think this is something we do at one moment in our life. We say, God, I want to follow you. God, I want all that you have for me. God, my life is yours. And then we find ourselves a week later saying, God, I wasn't so good at that last week. God, I I, I say that again. So it's something you do one time, but it's also something you do many times. Because as a living sacrifice, we move around. So you say, what does that look like? What does it look like to be a living sacrifice? And that means daily you give your life to the Lord. Daily you wake up and say, thanks God for this life. Thanks for this breath. Thanks for the new opportunity you've given to me. I give it back to you. What can I do to further the kingdom of God? So he says, let this be a living sacrifice. And then it says in the next verses, It says, and don't copy, in verse 2, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So when it says don't copy the behavior of the world and the customs of the world, that don't copy is in the tense of stop letting, stop copying the ways of the world. You're like, well, I'm not copying the ways of the world. Do you realize the average person gets about 1,500, 1,500 solicitations a day through advertisement, through suggestion, through everything else? The world, through marketing, is trying to push you in a certain direction. They're trying to fit you into a certain mold. And if you're just passive, you sit back, I'm not doing anything. You're being conformed to the world. The world is pushing you in a certain direction. You have to go upstream You have to point your boat upstream and turn on the motor just to stay in the same place. If you say, I'm done, and then you just drift, I'm done now, I'm good, you'll find yourself hitting markers that you thought were long gone. So it takes effort to even stay in the same place and more effort to be conformed into God's image. It says, so don't don't copy the behavior of the world. It says, but be transformed into a new person. This transformed is the word metamorphosis. It's only used one other place in the New Testament, and that's when Jesus Christ himself was glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration. That he let what was inside of him 
shine out. And that's all that God's asking us to do as Christians. When we are saved, he already changed you. He changed your DNA. He changed who you are. But that needs to go from the inside of you to the outside of you. And that takes a daily yielding to God. You don't have to invent it. You just have to say, okay, God, I know you've made me new. Let this newness come out. Because we have habits on the outside that need to go away. But from the inside out, we need to be transformed. It says, transformed into a new person by changing the way you think. Changing the way you think. I want you to know that you are the thinker of the thought. When thoughts come into your mind, you get to tell your mind what to do with it. You can say, get away from me, harmful thought. You can say, oh, that's a good thought. I'll keep that thought. These thoughts you are in control of. You decide what stays inside of your head. And I, the, the verses that help me out with that the most, because like I said, we're bombarded. It's not like we live in a neutral environment. We're bombarded by messages daily, minute by minute. In the Philippians chapter 4, in verse 7, it says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So if you want to keep your heart and mind, that happens through the peace of God through Christ Jesus. So it's talking about keeping our minds there. It says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You see what it's telling us to do? Don't, I'm just, I'm not telling you just don't think what the world thinks, because that's almost impossible to do. It's that thing of like trying to put this idea outside of your head by concentrating on not thinking about it. Well, that's all you're thinking about then. So it says, these things, think on these things. In other words, replace that outside influence with what God tells us to do, which is truth, lovely, honest, pure, virtuous, praiseworthy things. Make your mind think those things. Now, I'm going to tell you, that takes effort, doesn't it? The reason why we don't do it is because it's just easier just to slip her in neutral and not think at all. You know, you can ask my wife. She says, what are you thinking about? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> she says, it's impossible to think about nothing. I'm like, I do it all the time. But God says, and, and this is perfect for that garbage in thing. Like, if you happen to get stuck somewhere where CNN is on, you know, and all that stuff comes into your head, you got to go, what am I going to do with all this? It's kind of like lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. It's very fearful. It's very disconcerting. If you're not anxious or upset or whatever, you're not paying attention. I mean, because there's a lot of bad stuff happening in the world. And if you're at all sensitive, that hurts your feelings. That hurts your soul. It beats you up. But the Bible gives us an antidote for that. To keep our hearts and minds through the peace of Christ Jesus, he gives us a formula. Think on this, think on this, think on this, think on this. If you don't have this marked in your Bible, you should. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 through 9. It says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So he's saying, what you see here, do this. So if you're anxious, you're angry, you're worried, you're upset, do what the Bible says. That's the perfect antidote. It's so cool because... It would be tough if you were a person in this world trying to come up with solutions. Like you'd say, I'm a person, I came up with these great solutions. People say, well, you're one person. How long have you lived? What's your life experience? These things come from the very word of God, sacred scriptures. You can put your faith and trust on that. That's why we're a Bible church. Because it doesn't really matter what I say or think. It matters what the Bible says. So when the Bible says, hey, don't copy the behavior of the world, but change your minds. And then Philippians says, this is how you change your mind. Through scripture, through the washing of the water of the word of God. Our minds are transformed into God's way of thinking. Which is the definition of mental health. Because you know what? God knows the real deal. God knows what's actually true and what's actually false. So if we know what's actually true and actually false, 
you have a good grip on reality. What if you don't know what's actually true and what's actually false? That's the definition. The farther you are removed from reality, the more you know, messed up you are and the harder your life is because you're not in touch with what's real. So that's why we go through the Word of God, and I encourage you to read the Word of God yourself, is because these things moor us to reality. It says, um, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in the evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourself by the grace, by the faith that God has given us. So a real poignant part in here is, if you're doing all these things, don't become prideful. Don't think more of yourself than you ought to. Sometimes when I read scripture, I think, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. You know why? Because my mind is messed up. If your mind comes between you and what's good, then your mind is messed up. Like if your mind um, pushes you to be angry, you're not so smart that you're angry. You have an angry mind. If your mind makes you anxious, then you have an anxious mind. Your mind is what it does. If your mind puts you down a path that puts you in despair, then you have a despairing mind. And sometimes we think that's intelligence, but it's not. If intelligence makes you miserable, you have the worst kind of intelligence there is, which is no intelligence. So you have to calibrate. Your mind is a wonderful thing. I'm not telling you at all to dismiss your mind. But the best things in the world must be calibrated. The best thing you can think of, best machine that there ever was built, if it's calibrated wrong, it'll destroy itself or destroy something else. So how do you calibrate your mind? How do you get your mind to think the right way and down the right path? The Bible tells us, be humble. Don't think more of yourself than you ought to. Um, I want to turn that into a young person thing, but I guess the age doesn't... I mean, for me, when I was younger, I thought I was pretty smart. I thought my dad was pretty dumb. Um, I noticed the older I got, the smarter he got. (laughs) Because I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. Because when you're younger, you you have just as good of ability to think. You just don't have all the information. You just don't have context. You don't have experience by which to weigh things out. So God wants us to think his way. And not just for ourselves. And when I say that, it's because you can come up with the perfect philosophy, but if it's by yourself, it's of no use at all. In verse 4, it says, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so is Christ's body. We are many parts of the body, and yet we all belong to each other. So all of this is so we can function as a whole, as a whole body of Christ. The best body in the world, if you remove a hand from somebody, it almost destroys their sports career. There's like one, I remember one baseball player, I think his last name was Abbott, and he was a one-handed pitcher. And I remember watching a guy from Elmwood one time, I think he might have won the state championship with one hand. But take two hands away from him. Take two hands and a foot. There's no way to compete that way. And if we're all part of each other, we're all part of a body, then you look at that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, what are you if you're by yourself? The best hand in the world that's severed is kind of grotesque. You wouldn't want it delivered to your doorstep, that's for sure. Now, how, no matter how beautiful the hand is, separated, it's not, it doesn't have any context by which to operate. And the same... And when you're missing from your body, then your body doesn't benefit it either. God has put each and every one of us together for the benefit of ourselves and for the people around you. Um, America is kind of an individual sport, isn't it? We're all our own people. Rugged individualism. And that's kind of cool. But it's not biblical. It's It's not God's idea of the church. It goes opposite of the church. So sometimes some of our patriotic leanings and our individual leanings can go against what's best for us. 
So God says, be a part of a body. Why? For you and for the body. So we're all part of the same body, but I want you to know there's different parts. And like I said, 1 Corinthians 12 goes into this, but it says in verse 6, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If your gift is giving generously, then give. If, you're, if God has given you leadership ability, take responsibility seriously. And if you have been a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. These are seven different gifts that God lists out of people and what their gifting can be inside the church. But this is, I've heard these called motivational gifts. And it's kind of interesting because right now, like, if I got really parched and I'm really thirsty, and let's say um, some very well-meaning kid came up the aisle, he had a glass of grape juice to give me, you know, because he's, because I'm really thirsty. And he tripped and fell and broke that glass. Well, some people would be like, have the gift of prophecy, would be like, this reminds me of a Bible verse. You should walk circumspectly, you know. Then the person that has, like, the gift of mercy would be like, oh, poor kid, come here, you know. Sit down. Someone with the gift of leadership would be like, well, you know, there ought to be something in place where we have water at the pulpit. A kid shouldn't have to do that. <laughs> person with the gift of giving would be like, well, that carpet's ruined. Let me get out my checkbook. You know, there's the gift of encouragement, the different... And that's cool because there's all the, I can tell what kind of gift you have by the things you identify, by the things that you identify with and go, that needs to be done this way, that needs to be done this way. And that's a beautiful thing. But the problem comes in when you have somebody, like someone says, oh, you poor thing. Stop, stop encouraging him. Stop trying to teach him. He just needs to be comforted right now. And when the person goes, well, you're just always comforting people. They can never learn anything. Well, you know, this costs money, all your ideas about fixing that problem. I mean, that's going to cost something. You have all these ideas, but you don't have any financing for it. We can look at other people's gifts and go, those are in the way. I want you to know that we all see things from different perspectives and angles, and God calls us to different things. We need to give each other a break. You need to let people be who they are and handle things the way that they do and go, that's not the way I see it. But you know what? You're an adult. You have opinions. We all can disagree on certain things. I'm not saying sacrifice the truth. The truth is the truth. I mean, the guy walked down the alley, broke the glass. That's all true, right? How do we handle that? All seven different ways. There's seven different ways to look at it. Each one of those things are necessary and right. And it doesn't do us any good to look at the other person saying, you're handling it wrong. You handle what the Lord lays on your heart. That's how we're all better together. So it, it's important that you're part of a body. It's important that you let the other parts play their part. It's important that we work together in grace. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 30, is a, is a parable of the talents. And it says he gives to some five talents and to some two talents, and to some one talent. Then he comes back after a while and says, what did you do with the talent I gave you? I almost look at it, it's kind of funny because there's seven talents here, or seven things he gives us. I think some people have five of these things. I think some of us have two, and some of us have one. God expected that each person did with what he gave them, everything he gave them. If you, if you have the gift of leadership, God wants you to be a leader. And I don't care if you have a name tag or if you want to cop to it or not. If you're a leader, you're a leader, and you'll be held responsible for your leadership. I can say this from my own viewpoint. For years, people said, Rich, you're a leader. I'm like, yeah, really? I don't get a check in the mail. I don't get, you know, you see a leader badge here? And so how do you know if you're a leader? Well, one thing, you question leadership a lot. Like, everyone can say something, you're like, not necessarily. <laughs> I don't know about that. That's a leader. A leader fearlessly questions authority and does the right thing. 
which makes them real fun to be around. <laughs> I have a lot of leaders in my family. It, it causes interesting conversations, but it makes you grow up. But leadership is a responsibility that if you know that you're influenced, I don't care if you influence one person, two people, you are responsible for what you influence them to do. Period. Paycheck or not, name tag or not. If you're supposed to show the gift of mercy, it says show it graciously. You give mercy to people graciously. Not like, well, I'll forgive you this time, but next time. No, you just do it happily, graciously. If God's given you the gift of giving, you give, it says, with simplicity in the King James. Sometimes when people have the gift of giving, they go, here's my money, but I want you to spend it this way and this way. And, and No, when you give, you just give. Go, there it is. God gave it to me, I give it to you. And I love that God's been giving people different generous hearts. So if you have these certain gifts, it's up to you to use them. Not under compulsion, but because God wants you to, and it's the best thing. Now, it's going to go through 20 things here right now. 20 different mini commandments in the New Testament that kind of tell you if you're on track or not. These are not like a list of 20 things that you're supposed to write on your refrigerator and try to do them all every day. They're like, I'm trying... The big thing is you're trying to follow the Lord. You're trying to um, be filled with the Holy Spirit and represent God's kingdom. And when you're doing that, your life should look a certain way. It should look selfless. So you should be looking about other people. You should be looking at the future in the kingdom of God. And so when you do that, these attributes will start to tick off one at a time. So this is more of something to hold up to your life and go, is this typical of me? Is this like me? Or just not like me. And when these things are not like me, what can I change? What can I surrender to make them more like me? So let's read through them. They're pretty self-explanatory. Um, it says, don't pretend to love others. Really love them. So be sincere. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. When I say hate what is wrong, I don't mean hate the people that are wrong. It means don't in our society, and I'll tell you, I'm very guilty of this. When there's something really evil or wrong, I am captivated by it. I'm like, I shouldn't look at that. <laughs> like, it's like a bad wreck, you know, like that you, got, you almost got to look. Or like, so you can like look at evil, it can be entertaining. It can be mesmerizing. It can be, and our society has done a really good job at making that attractive and funny. And so the darkness can become attractive. It says to hate it. Uh, the King James says abhor it. That means get away from it. It's actually um, a contrast here. It says hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. And that hold tightly word is the same word that it uses for marriage with your husband and wife, that you cleave to it. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. So whatever God's given you to do, work hard at it and do it enthusiastically. And sometimes people think, well, I'm not the pastor. I don't have an important job. I came across a story as I was studying, and I thought it was remarkable. And so there was a guy, his last name was Kimball. He was a Sunday school teacher, and it, it really was moved in his heart to go to one person in Sunday school and talk to them at their place of work. And so the guy went to a shoe store and talked to one of his kids named Dwight L. Moody. And so he won Dwight L. Moody to the Lord. He discipled him. And Dwight L. Moody went on to rock this continent and England also. When Dwight L. Moody was in the British Isles, he was preaching in a little church. And the guy at that church's name was F.B. Meyer. And F.B. Meyer was so taken by the fact that one Sunday school teacher would take interest in one person that he became a dynamite evangelist. And when he was a dynamite evangelist, he went to all over the world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and telling people to evangelize. He came across a place in Massachusetts where there was a guy named Wilbur Chapman. Wilbur Chapman 
was sitting on the back row. He was a washed out preacher. And F.B. Meyer said, if you're not willing to do anything for the Lord, would you pray one prayer with me that you would be willing for God to make you willing to do anything for him? Would you just pray that God would, you'd open your heart that God would make you willing? Well, he opened his heart to the Lord. He became a great evangelist. His assistant was Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was a great evangelist, reached thousands of people. Um, he was preaching in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1924. There's a bunch of godly men who heard him and said, we need revival in this town. So they started praying in this little country farm. They said, God, could you just raise up somebody to reach Charlotte, North Carolina? And so they brought in this old-time preacher, Mordecai something or other. I can't remember his name. But his name was Mordecai. I remember that. And he preached and preached and preached. And there was a kid sitting on the front row, 16 years old, was watching this kid preach and said, I think the Lord wants me to do that. And that was Billy Graham. So you look at one Sunday school teacher just listening to what God's laid on their heart and showing some attention, some affection, some thought towards what God put them to do can just launch a cascade of events where God reaches many people. There's no small jobs in the kingdom of God. They say the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. For you mothers and fathers out there, raising one, one child for the Lord, what an impact it can have on this world. I, I just, I love what's happening with our youth. I love what's happening with scripture memorization. God's word doesn't come back void, you know that? I just, I can't tell you how thrilled I am that that's happening in our church. I can't tell you how much I just thank God for Melvin and Mariah for doing that. I just ask him, how's it going and what can we do for you? Because that's, that's the church model we have here. That when God lays something on your heart, we go, what can we do for you? How can we help make that happen? So in, it says, rejoice in confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them, and always eager to practice hospitality. Now, those are all the things we should be like proactively. That should be like the desire of our heart to be looking out to others. Now, this next part is kind of like what happens when people don't respond well to that. Because in verse 14, it says, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Do you feel persecuted? Do you feel pushed on? Pray that God would bless the people who are doing it. How do you like them apples? <laughs> I don't, I don't like them very good. When you push me, I like to push back. When you persecute me, I want to persecute back. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Now, this, again, is the one that hits really close to home because if you're crying, I like to say, hey, cheer up, buddy. <laughs> it ain't that bad. You know, there are people who have real problems in the world. No, it says weep with those who weep. It also says rejoice with those who rejoice or be happy with those who are happy. Again, when someone's too happy, I'm like, hey, you know, things could, you know, things could make, take a turn here. I like to be like a counterbalance for some reason. And God says, no, be happy with those who are happy. Be sad with those who are sad. You know, in other words, just have genuine empathy with other people. Relate to them where they're at and who they're at. It says, um, live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company company of ordinary people and do not think you know it all. <laughs> God must love ordinary people because he made so many of them. <laughs> Just be an ordinary person and enjoy ordinary people and don't think too highly of yourself. Don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable. Do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. Now you can't be at peace with everyone. Some people just won't be at peace with you. But that's got to be on them. You got to do everything you can to be at peace with them. You have to do all your part. If they won't have any of it, they won't have any of it. You can't make someone be your friend. But you can definitely make it so that if anyone asks you or anyone's looking at it, it looks like a one-sided equation. You know, they did everything they could to get along with that person. 
But the person said, no. That's what God wants from us. Dear friends, never take revenge. Hear that? Never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. But the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, saith the Lord. Or vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. In other words, if you have an enemy out there, someone who is an avowed enemy of everything you stand for, be nice to them. Now, that is not the way that the mainstream is acting out there against their enemies. Whether you want to be conservative or liberal, most people are going, well, they did it first. We need to be a little bit more mature than sixth graders. They did it first doesn't cut it. Be the person that God called you to be. Be Christ-like. Can you imagine if Jesus did what you deserved? Saying you did it first? Where would you be? If Christ is our example, he's always trying to reconcile. He was our friend when he was when we were his enemy. When we were opposed to him, he was doing things for us. It says, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. How does evil conquer you? When it makes you like them. When it makes you, when the world conforms you so you're just as nasty as they are and use the same tactics they do. It says, conquer evil by doing good. Now, I think when you read this list, I don't want this to be the new law to us because we're under grace. Like I said before, this is like a comparison. Is this how I am? There's only one way to act like this. That's to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. This is a full circle chapter because it says, brothers and sisters, I'm begging you, please, give your bodies to God every day like a living sacrifice. That's what's reasonable. And then it tells us what that looks like. And then at the end it says, don't be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. There's only one way to do that. And I've talked about it before. I don't think I can be, I don't think I can repeat this one thing too many times. And that's when it comes to the Holy Spirit. If you are a born-again Christian, you have the power of the Holy Spirit at your disposal. God wants you to succeed in your Christianity. God wants to empower you in your Christianity. But you've got to want to do that, and it takes something active of you. In John chapter 14, verse 17, Jesus told his disciples, the Holy Spirit is with you, but it will be in you. It was with you, it's going to be in you. The Holy Spirit is with everyone in the world trying to convert them to Christianity. Did you know that? It's convicting hearts. It's convicting minds. It's trying to change people. That's the Holy Spirit going, come on, come on. Once you accept Christ, he is in you. If the Holy Spirit's not in you, you're not saved. It is the seal of salvation. He is inside of you. And that's when Jesus Christ breathed on his disciples. It says in chapter 20, verse 22 of John, it says, Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So he's in me. You're like, but it doesn't feel like he's in me. I feel evil. I feel bad. I do bad things. Well, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it said, but you'll receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. There is a filling of the Holy Spirit Oh, he's already in me, right? I know he's in me because he sealed me to the day of judgment. He says he's going to do that. I'm his. I'm marked by him. I've been born again. I've been changed. But there's a difference between that and being overflowed by the Holy Spirit where he is working through me. That is, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Upon you. And that's what we're praying when we pray every morning. We present our bodies a living sacrifice. Come upon me. Let me see the world the way you see it. Let me hear the way, hear things the way you hear them. Let me think your thoughts. Let me be your agent, your ambassador to the world around me. Now, 
Again, uh, we'll turn real quick. This We'll turn here at closing. In Luke chapter 11, 13, people go, well, I want the Holy Spirit upon me. What procedure do I have to do to get that? And there's a simple procedure. It's called act like a kid. <laughs> yeah, just ask. Act like a kid in this respect. Um, in verse uh, th- 11... We'll go with 11, verse 9. It says, And I say, and I, and I tell you, keep on asking, and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open." You fathers, if, you chil- if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if, you're sin- if, you, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So how do you get the Holy Spirit? The same way that your kids get food from you. Mom and Dad, I'm hungry. Would you please give me some food? Lord, I want to be a living sacrifice. I want to be a good Christian. I want to do the right thing. Would you please give me your Holy Spirit so this can be possible? Because if you do it under your own power, I've tried to be a good person under my own power. That causes a friction within me because it's not really who I am in a way. So I have to do it through the overflowing of the Holy Spirit so that none of me gets on it. So that it's a pure representation of Christ, not Rich's imitation version of it. So I think the Bible lays it out pretty clearly, and I, I like formulas like that. I like to look at it and go, what do you do to live a Christian life? Present your body as a living sacrifice. For what? So that you can function in the body the way you're supposed to. What does that look like? 20 verses. What are we supposed to do? Don't let evil conquer us, but conquer evil with good. How do we do that? The Holy Spirit. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, you would impress it into our hearts. Um, we don't have the ability but you do. We know that you love us and you won't you won't stop working on us, Lord, even if we've been unfaithful. So I pray if we have been unfaithful, Lord, we would just give it back to you. And that every morning we'd wake up and say, it's your day, Lord. We want to serve you. It's our reasonable service. Thanks again for bringing us together and giving us the privilege of family here, giving us the privilege of living in a country where gathering like this costs us nothing but our time. In Jesus' name, amen.
God, we just want to thank you so much for being such an amazing God. Thank you for loving us, not to keep us where we are at, and Lord, to grow us even more in you and to become more and more like your son, Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would just breathe your presence upon the church right now. Lord, that you would just connect your body and Lord, bring those dry bones to life. Lord, we pray that that church would spread your word throughout this world to the ends of the earth that everybody who hears your name, Lord, can come to know who you are. Lord, we pray that you would just fill your people, fill us as we leave this place today. Lord, I pray that you would just go before us and just pave the way, Lord, for your spirit to work. And Lord, that we would all be seeking after you in the days to come. Father, we love you so very much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 